Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we are so grateful for the ways that you work in our lives, for the ways that you guide us, for the ways that you do give us strength. Lord, I pray that uh, you will always help us to seek you in all things. Lord, I ask that at any time uh, during this message, if there's something that's distracting us, something that's pulling us away from you, that you will let those things fall away, God, so that we may focus on you, your word, and your presence, which is here among us to minister to us, God. As these words that I say that they'll be your words, let anything I said that's not of you, let that fall away like chaff. But in all things, God, may we give you honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know if any of you had to read the story of the Odyssey when you were in high school, but I remember reading it. And there's this one scene that stuck with me where Odysseus, he's trying to get home, and he's, he's got his ship, and he's come to a narrow strait. And on one side is Scylla, or Scylla, in different pronunciations, I'm going to say Scylla. But on one side is Scylla, which is kind of like cragged rocks, people think, but it was the personification of that. It was this uh, person that reached out to try to grab sailors to kill them. And on the other side, in this very narrow strait, was Charybdis. It's also the personification of a whirlpool that was spinning around, and if you went into it, it would destroy the entire ship. And Odysseus has to pick one or the other. He can't, it's impossible to sail through without hitting one or the other. And either one is a good decision. And so that's why we have that expression, stuck between Scylla and Charybdis, or perhaps we say stuck between a rock and a hard place. You know, there's also the, the saying that, you know, uh, I'll clean it up a little bit, darned if you do, and darned if you don't. That we have those moments where there are the hard decisions in our lives. And it seems like no matter what we choose, we're going to either let our family down, our friend down, ourselves down, God down, and, and we don't know which direction to go. I mean, we're all faced with things like that. Many people experience a uh, tension between their work and their family life. Because they want to work hard and be successful and provide for their family, but to do so could take away from time that you have to spend with your family. But let's say you do work hard, so that's one thing. And then let's say you work hard and you have all this extra money because of it. Do you then choose to have a bigger house than you need because, hey, you can afford it? Or do you choose to have work less, have less money, a smaller house, than spend time with your family because of that? Or maybe you don't have the bigger house at all, but you choose to have more disposable income to do fun trips and fun things with your family. Or, and I think this would be a great novel idea, to be generous with that money. To give it to God, to give it to charities, to give it to bless other people. Those are dilemmas people have. Within the family itself, you may have dilemmas with your spouse about how many kids should we have? Very recently, one of my best friends was telling me that he and his wife just decided that they were only going to have two children, which they have now, and they're done. But for all his life, he wanted three. He was the third of three. His dad was the third of three. This is what they, he had always wanted. But when he looked at the family finances, how much time having two kids under two years of age was already taking up, he and his wife said, you know what, we're, we're just going to have two. There are all sorts of dilemmas that we may have. The one I mentioned in the children's sermon is also a great one. It applies to kids. If you see a friend of yours being bullied, it can be hard to want to do the right thing there and stand up for them. But of course, bullies aren't for just for kids. Bullying may take a different form, but there are adult bullies too. And it can be hard to do the right thing and to stand up for the person who's being bullied. Especially if that might turn to you, or if other people might think less of you for doing it. But fortunately, even though all of us face hard decisions in our lives, this isn't something that's unique to us. People always have had these dilemmas, these hard decisions where they don't exactly know what to do. And faithful people, of course, we pray. We seek out God. We want to hear God's voice on that. And part of the way that God speaks to us, of course, is through his word. And Joseph, who we're going to hear about, definitely had a bit of a dilemma. So let's open our Bibles to 
together now and look at our gospel lesson. It's from the Gospel of Matthew, the first chapter, verses 18 through 25. Luke, excuse me, Matthew writes, Now the birth of, the, of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, quote, look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now Joseph finds out about Mary, finds out she's pregnant, and he knows that he is not the father. See, in Jewish marriage at this time, they were all been arranged. Marriages were arranged by families. But before they entered into the period of engagement, both the man and the woman had a chance to say they didn't want to marry the person, and then they didn't have to. But both Mary and Joseph had obviously consented, which is why they were engaged. And now, in this time, they would be engaged, betrothed, for a period of one year. And so even though they were engaged, though, they still were not officially married. They had no relations with one another. But the engagement could only be broken by a divorce. It was that serious. And so instead of using the term fiancé, they didn't have that. Once you were engaged, the person who was your fiancé for the male is called husband, and of course for the uh, fiancé for the woman is called wife. And so in many ways, they are husband and wife in committal, but not in actuality. They haven't been living together as husband and wife. <coughs> and Joseph finds out Mary is pregnant. Now the text says he's an honorable man. According to the law, he could have brought her in front of the entire town right at the gate of the town, and dismissed her in that way. In fact, she might have been stoned in Old Testament times. This wasn't as common in the first century, but the law says that that's something that you can do for adultery. But Joseph, he's a good man. He's an honorable man. He doesn't want to expose Mary to any more public disgrace. Because obviously, there's going to be a stigma in that time for having a child or a wedlock. So he says, he makes up his mind, rather, He's going to dismiss her quietly. See, that's the first dilemma that, that Joseph had. Because how could he believe Mary's story? I mean, how could he believe that the Holy Spirit came upon her and that the child wasn't any man's child, but was God's son? So when you have the choice of that or using your common sense, he went with what seems like the most obvious and correct thing said, well, she's been unfaithful to me. And so she deci he decided because of that to dismiss her. Right after he had made this decision, an angel of the Lord appeared to him and told him that what Mary had said was true, that she, the son, the child in her womb was from God, from the Holy Spirit. And then he said, don't be afraid to take her as your wife. But what, what might Joseph have been afraid of? What was he risking by taking Mary as his wife? You see, if he had decided to stay with her, there are those who would have said, this is an admission of guilt. This is his child. He, even though he thought he was honorable, even though he thought he followed the law, clearly he has sinned, and he's now stuck with this woman, and that's why he's agreed to marry her. Because who else would say, even though you've been faith unfaithful to me when we're not even married yet, I'm still 
going to stay with you and raise some other man's child. Because the person who did that would be considered a fool. So that was his option. He can be considered a sinner, a sinful man, who is not the person everybody thought he always was. Or he could be a fool. The man who decided to stick with a woman who was unfaithful to him and then raised some other man's child as his own. I mean, can you imagine people's reactions when Joseph made that decision? Like, Joseph, why are you staying with her? This is foolish. Dismiss her. I mean, if it were you, would you tell people, guys, I'm telling you what she's saying is true. An angel appeared to you would look even more like a fool. But maybe this is one of the first times we see as Joseph was waiting to meet Jesus during his own Advent season that sometimes in order to meet Jesus you've got to be willing to look like a fool. Because if you were in that situation if you were Joseph what would you have done? I mean, I feel like, look, we're, we're in a church. We're a faithful people. So I'm sure that at least on some level, we'd say, I would obviously obey the angel. I would obey God. It's so simple. I mean, think about the old dilemmas you've had in your own life. If at any time when you're you know, praying by your bed or sitting at your dining room table or wherever it is you pray, as you're praying hard to God for guidance, and suddenly the sky opened up and an angel appeared to you and said, hey, by the way, this is what you should do, it would seem to be really easy to obey. It's like, wow, thanks, God. Like, that's really great. Super easy to do. And yet... How often do we disobey God now? I mean, how often do we know what God calls us to? How often have we seen what God reveals to us through His Word and yet still choose the easier path, the more socially acceptable path, instead of adhering to the things that we know God has called us to? See, prior to this moment already, Joseph had a habit of obedience. The text says that he was righteous. He was righteous according to the law. So he was prepared in one sense, or at least as prepared as he could be, to obey when he was given this greater standard of obedience. You know, Jesus said, you have to prove yourself faithful in the small things in order to be entrusted with the big. But the difference was, for Joseph, in every previous time, being obedient to the law had also been the socially accepted thing to do. In the previous times, being obedient had made people think more of him. There are times, and that's going to be the case for us too, there are times when being faithful to God will make people think more of you. Oh, isn't she so loving? Oh, isn't he so generous? What about the times and following after God's call isn't so easy when it's not as socially acceptable or when it makes you look foolish. I mean, isn't it foolish in some way, especially in an uncertain economy, to give generously instead of deciding to hoard as much as possible? And yet God calls us to tithe and to be generous givers. Isn't it foolish to choose to open up your home and adopt or do foster care in this uncertain time? And yet, what better picture of grace and our own adoption as God's children is there than the act of adoption itself? Isn't it foolish to choose to do without a bigger house or a better car than you can easily afford in order to be able to use that money to help other people, to bless other people? Isn't it foolish to talk to other people about what God has done in your life when you know that doing so is going to make them think less of you? Isn't it foolish to invite people here to worship with us especially if they seem a little different from us. But you know what? I, I think that maybe we serve 
a foolish God. Because think about it. When God wanted to reconcile us to himself, it was all our doing. Everything that's been wrong was our fault. But God still wanted us to be reconciled, to be atoned. And so what does he do? He sends his perfect, blameless son to suffer and die for us. That's foolish by the standards of this world. When God wants to change this world and to work for justice, he calls us to do it. And that's foolish because we're frail and feeble and we so often choose our own self-interest instead of working for justice in this world. And yet we're God's plan A, by the way. That's not plan C or D or anything else that's falling through. His first plan for this world is for his body to make a difference in this world. And considering our own human failings, maybe that's foolish. Maybe it's foolish that God has chosen us or loves us or hears our prayers at all, given how unfaithful we often are. See, that's the God that we serve, though. A God that, by the standards of the world, is a fool. Because why would God do these things? And yet, if you want to follow after God, if you want to be his children, then I think we've all got to be fools, too. And I hope that you can handle that. I hope that I can handle that. But let's be fools for God together. Let's be the ones who will love on people and invite them in when no one else wants them. Let's be the people who will reach out and care for people despite what everyone else thinks. Let's be the people who will live easily within our means so that we have more to give away to bless people. Let's be the people who decide with us it all changes. This community will be different. This world will be different. And it may not be something that ever makes the evening news, but God will know and in the kingdom of God what is foolish for man is wisdom. See, Joseph knew. Joseph knew. In order, in order to meet the Messiah sometimes, you have to make that decision that people think is foolish. Man, let us be fools together. Amen.